This is Up Close. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. In this week's episode, we're looking at what it means to build and destroy civil societies. A lot of hope accompanied the end of the Soviet Union, and with good reason for many territories and countries that fell within the Iron Curtain. But under Vladimir Putin, Russia now has less wealth per person than India, while a band of 100 or so billionaires rules the roost alongside their president. Karen Dewisha puts together all the pieces for us in Putin's kleptocracy, Who Owns Russia? After the Soviet Union's fall, many described the areas left as a Wild West, but imagining a true new Wild West is Eden Lepucky, author of California. And then, looking at what kind of development has accompanied Jewish migration is sociologist Deborah Dash Moore with her book, Urban Origins of American Judaism. But first, here's my interview with Miami University professor Karen Dewisha on Putin's kleptocracy. So who does own Russia? Well, a small group around Vladimir Putin, uh, 110 billionaires, according to a report that came out last year with Credit Suisse, which is in the book, uh, own 35% of the wealth of Russia. So we're not talking about a 1% problem. We're talking about a 35% problem. It's a, a very, very small group. It seems like the much larger crime is that in order to take that little bit for themselves, they sold a ton of Russian resources uh, without getting any profit for, the, for Russia, right. for the people, right? right? I mean, very often what would happen is that the state, you know, would invest its money in developing a resource, and then at the moment that that resource was ready to come online, that, <laughs> that now state-owned company would be privatized to insiders, and they would reap the profit. So you have this kind of governing principle in, of the Putin regime that they're nationalizing the risk and they're privatizing the reward. So this 110, they don't have a lot of skin in the game themselves. Right. And one of the more damning aspects of this is that where, where we often say, well, capitalism on its own can create a certain demand for proper procedures, proper mm -hmm. courts and so forth, because the people with the money want to be able to hold on to it and don't want bandits at their door and so forth. But you suggest that because of our globalized economy, they can park their money somewhere else and be just fine. Yeah. I mean, they're they have an interest in being able to maraud freely through the Russian economy because they've got their money in Switzerland, Cyprus, British Virgin Islands, or wherever, and it's nicely protected. So they don't have an interest in the rule of law. It, it actually would slow them down in Russia if, if there were rule of law. So th I think that's, that's very, very critical. And now Eden Lepucky imagines a dystopian wasteland in California. So what does the end of today's world look like? <laughs> well, Ursula Le Guin says that uh, speculative fiction writers are not predictors, they are describers of the present. So I'll just say that. I don't want to mm. predict a, a sad future for us all, but in the world of California, um, Frida and Cal, the husband and wife who, or the wife and husband, I should say, who flee LA, um, the world that they are living in, let's see, there's some earthquakes that pretty much devastate LA and then San Francisco, and there have been snowstorms that have decimated the population in the Midwest and the Northeast. Um, all the rich have fled to these private communities where it's really difficult to get into unless you have a lot of money. Um, and sort of LA is left to rot because there's no tax base. Right, and then you also, you portray what the, kind of, what the structure of society becomes. You know, when you remove modern uh, modern conveniences, but also modern governance structures. And uh, one of the starkest aspects of that is you suggest that, that without modern conveniences and so forth, men and women end up in a very different situation than they are now. Yeah, um, I started the novel at a place called U Cross, which is a residency in Wyoming where it's basically heaven for artists, where you get to work all day and they serve you meals. Um, and one day we got to go on this ranch ra ranch ride about, and we 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 rode over to a ghost abandoned town that was by the, this abandoned railroad track. And the friend I was with, Ben Fountain, who's another writer, he said, you know, women used to get hernias all the time when they were trying to build these new communities. Um, and you know, it was basically, you know, they tried to do what the men could do and they couldn't do it. And I thought that was a really startling fact that kind of stuck with me and it got me thinking about if we didn't have the structure of civilization and the skills that are sort of unisex were 
not needed anymore and all you needed was brute force, then women, women would be at a disadvantage. Um, and that's really horrifying to me. Um, so I, I definitely pushed that idea in the book. When you're reflecting on kind of these worst case scenarios, what does that tell you about today in terms of our best case scenario? I, I'm, I'm of two minds because I tend to feel as if things are getting better and better for women. Um, and, you know, I'm in a relationship that's really fulfilling and we both work, we have a child, we share childcare together, we both clean the house, we both make money, and that feels really good for both of us. Um, and I feel like all of my female peers have that as well. Um, but then I turn on the radio and you hear about things that are, you know, not even in this, you know, not in this country, you know, um, the girl, the school girls in Nigeria, um, just you hear all these horrifying things and you think, you know, how could we, how could these coexist in the same world? Which makes me think, if a situation gets bad in any country, women seem to be the first to suffer. And finally, in the construction of urban life in America, Jews reflected city life and city life reflected Judaism. Here's sociologist Deborah Dash Moore on the urban origins of American Judaism. We all started in cities uh, here in America, despite the fact that we have so many uh, suburban elements of our community today. So this book was an effort to sort of reclaim um, a past that suburban Jews, who are now most Jews living in the suburbs, have no idea about. And to get a sense of the ways in which cities were really formative for American Judaism. What do you mean they have no idea about? Because it's not that, uh, is it that hard to imagine what city life is like for these suburban Jews? So I teach suburban Jews, okay? And um, I always like like to ask them, how many of you grew up in a house, right? And everyone raises his or her hand. And uh, that means they grew up on more than one floor. It means that they grew up with a yard or, or some private area around them. It means that they grew up um, maybe with sidewalks, maybe without sidewalks, certainly with an automobile as the main mode of transportation, not walking. And then I tell them that I grew up in an apartment on the 11th floor, right? Mm -hmm. And they are like stunned, right? You can grow up on the 11th floor in an apartment, right? right. Who Everything knew things grew there, that's right? That's correct. And that, I think, defines a lot of what, um, of what is that difference between suburban urban divides, where you have a, a big difference between the Jewish suburban enclave and the Jewish urban residences. You don't get to choose who your neighbors are. Yes, I, I think that's very important. There's, there's, um, you don't get to choose who your neighbors are in terms of religion, in terms of ethnicity, even in terms of class. Um, you know, you can move to a fancy apartment building, but then a couple of blocks away, there may be, um, you know, working class or, or middle class housing. So you're, you're not insulated from um, the mixtures that cut across class, ethnicity, religion. What you talk about, and it's kind of funny for me to think about this, that you go back to the 18th century before steel-framed buildings and so forth, there was an urban sensibility in America that transformed the Jewish community. Yes, so Charleston, which was the, uh, the largest Jewish community back at the beginning of the 19th century, around five, 600 Jews, you know, but um, that was a big, number, uh, becomes this place where you get really interesting innovation. So you get the first Hebrew orphan asylum, right? And why do they do that? Because these young Jews see what Protestants are doing. And there are a lot of different Protestant groups down um, and uh, in Charleston, and they're, they're mixing with them. And then you get this early effort to reform. Um, uh, Judaism in the 1820s. And th it's basically the children of the, the parents who, the, really the, the men, who run the one synagogue um, in Charleston. And their sons, and to a certain extent a couple of daughters, their, their sons say, you know, let's, can we have some changes? We, we'd like with like explanations. We don't understand what's being said in the, when the Hebrew is read. And the fathers say, no. The way you would assimilate was different in urban areas from how it was in rural areas, where in rural areas, by and large, the Jewish traces simply went away. In urban areas, there was, it was an assimilation and at the same time, a sense of identity. 
Yeah, so it's not just um, a positive experience, there are negative experiences. But the negative experiences, the conflicts that occur on the streets and stuff um, in the cities, especially starting in the 19th century, these conflicts are also productive of uh, interesting Jewish responses. That's all for this week's abbreviated web episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable or listen to the full audio of the show as a podcast available on iTunes and your favorite podcast player. The Jewish channel is available on cable by Warner Cable Channel 1640, Iowa Link Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast and the on-demand menu on TV. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.